our uh, fourth group uh, includes uh, Republican candidate James Hernandez and Democrat um, candidate Abel Herrero. So let's begin with an opening statement from Mr. Hernandez. We're going to go um, alphabetically. So Mr. Hernandez, you have two minutes, please. Hi, I'm your candidate and your friend for Texas House of Representatives, James Hernandez. I'm running for this district because this district is a working class district that needs a working class person. And I'm here for you and I'm here to represent you no matter the party affiliation. I grew up in this district, born and raised. I had a single mother, raised us. We grew up in poverty, homeless, and in shelters. This kind of experience that I'm going to bring to help everybody in this uh, area to be able to lift up, lift themselves up from the bootstraps. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for your opening statement, um, Mr. Herrera. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You have okay. two minutes. All right. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters. Thank you to the, the constituents of District 34. Thank you to my family uh, for allowing me to run for state representative uh, for District 34. As you know, um, my mom raised my brother and I as a single parent. Uh, she made a lot of sacrifices, just like we as parents make sacrifices day in and day out. But there was one thing that we knew is that we had faith in our future because my mom worked hard. We knew that an education and working hard will allow us to be able to improve our family and, and our settings, if you will. So that's why I make public education a priority because education is important. It makes life changes for individuals and communities and families. And so that's why I support our teachers. We need to make pay raises for our teachers across the board. We need to make sure we provide the resources in the classroom to allow students to succeed. And that's why we have faith in our future. We also have to make sure that the homes that we come to, regardless of what they are, that they're not taken away by the government or some means like Texas windstorm insurance. So we have to continue the fight to ensure that our homes are there for us when we get out of school or return to work or from work. So fighting together, we know that we will have faith in our future. And the people that fight more than any of us are the ones that are in the military, fighting overseas and then coming home only to fight against the illnesses that came home with them in the battles. So we must continue to support our veterans, provide the assistance and the care that they've earned and that they deserve, which is why by working together, we can ensure that our veterans have faith in their future. We have to make sure that also we have the economic development for these veterans that are coming home, that are adjusting from a military life to civilian life, to make sure that all, all other individuals, especially those that are affected by COVID-19 and lost their jobs, have the ability to rebound. So we have to continue to work with our port to ensure that there's economic development and growth and jobs, because we know that uh, under COVID and any other dire circumstances, there's stress and things that uh, come to the home. And we have to make sure that we um, rid ourselves of not just the violence in the streets, but violence in homes, which is why I've been a proponent in working with the women's shelter to ensure that we get rid of domestic violence. Thank you and very much, Mr. Herrera. We appreciate that opening statement. We will now move to the uh, question um, portion. You will have one minute to answer and I'll repeat the questions in between. We'll go alphabetically and then switch in the middle. So we'll um, go back and forth. Okay, uh, Mr. Hernandez, uh, the first question, you are first. During the uncertain times of the COVID-19 pandemic, what specific changes, if any, should be made to public school financing to provide for equitable and safe environments, both physical and virtual, for Texas schools? I'm glad you asked that. There's communities out like in the Petronila, Bishop, Alvaduce, Banquete, that don't really have the means that some of our bigger school districts have. We need to be able to focus and highlight on these areas to be able to get these, uh, the Wi-Fi, the computers, or other means that they have. But it's not just that. We need to reinforce the, uh, the cleaning that we do have uh, in the schools uh, for these so that our children and our teachers can be able to return safely. And it's not just that. We have our support staff, such as our custodians and our uh, maintenance staff, they need to be able to work safely. So to be able to provide the funding uh, is something that I'd be happy to look into and to work to be able to get to these, uh, to, to provide the proper PPE for the teachers to feel comfortable and the parents to be able to feel comfortable sending their children into school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Herrera, please unmute yourself. 
and I will repeat the question. All right. Um, during the uncertain times of the COVID-19 pandemic, what specific changes, if any, should be made to public school financing to provide for equitable and safe environments, both physical and virtual, for Texas schools? We should allow our school districts not to be penalized for the attendance of students uh, during this COVID pandemic emergency. In other words, if students are attending uh, via Zoom or um, homeschooling, if you will, uh, the school districts were concerned that if they force the students and by that the teachers to the classroom, um, that, that they were forced to bring them to the classroom in order to get the funding. And so we have to make sure that we provide that safety and the shelter, if you will, for our students and our teachers. So not to penalize, in other words, suspend, if you will, the penalties that TEA would impose upon our school districts and instead allow real, true local control so our school districts can make those decisions based on the assessments that are there present in their district and in their classrooms without feeling the pressure uh, from TEA. Thank you very much, Mr. Arrow. Okay, and just go ahead and stay on because you will answer first this for this um, question. For some time, Texas has led the nation in the rate of uninsured citizens. This situation has been compounded substantially by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many in District 34 have lost their employer provided insurance for physical and mental health care. What, if any, measures would you take to address this crisis? Yeah, we would expand Medicaid. Uh, that's one issue that we've uh, tried repeatedly over the last couple of sessions but have been unsuccessful. And when I say we, I mean Democrats and Republicans. Dr. Zorwas, who was the chair of the Appropriations Committee and is a Republican, but also a medical doctor, was a strong advocate for expanding on Medicaid care, not just as it relates to individuals that are in need of any type of medical care, but especially when it comes to mental health. Uh, Nueces County obviously has a population that is in great need of uh, mental health care needs. And so knowing that San Antonio really is the closest area that where we can get uh, additional health beds. So we have to make sure that we expand on Medicaid health and we make sure that we increase the bed capacity um, in our hospitals, uh, not just here locally, but allow for uh, individuals to be able to be transferred to San Antonio without having to wait in jails, for example. Um, the, the treatment that people receive for mental health shouldn't be uh, in our jails. Uh, it needs to be in the hospitals where they can get true proper medical care. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Hernandez, go ahead and unmute yourself and I will repeat the question. Um, for some time, Texas has led the nation in the rate of uninsured citizens. This situation has been compounded substantially by the COVID-19 pandemic. Many in District 34 have lost their employer provided insurance for physical and mental health care. What, if any, measures would you take to address this crisis? I'm glad you asked that. As a child that grew up uh, needing Medicare, food stamps, and other uh, government assistance programs, uh, I know that there's a great need for it, but the answer isn't always expanding. What we should be focusing on are businesses that can weather the storms like COVID-19 so that people don't have to lose their health care. They don't have to lose their jobs. We need to be able to have businesses that are built on a sturdy foundation that can continue uh, to work during these pandemics. We need to be able to have businesses that can help the community because District 34 has about a 30% poverty rate. So this is something that's been going on before the COVID-19. So we need to be able to work with our local sectors, our private sectors and our businesses, especially small businesses, so that small businesses can continue to be able to provide a healthcare, be able to provide a paycheck on uh, Friday as well as a job on Monday. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Hernandez. Go ahead and stay on because you'll you'll be able you'll be answering this question first this time. Okay. So go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, the League of Women Voters supports online registration and universal ballot by mail. What policies, if any, do you support to improve voter participation and to ensure secure elections in Texas? First of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for being able to get out the vote and register as many people as you do. Uh, one of the biggest things that we lack is the reason why. Okay, so when I spoke to my grandmother about running in these races, my grandmother, she was suffering the, for, with dementia before she passed. But one of the things that she told me is that I wish I could vote for you. Now, here we are in the 100th anniversary of women voting. And my grandmother is saying, I wish I could vote for you. 
you know, that, that's one of the most heartbreaking things because that followed by it's a woman's job to stay in the house and cook and clean. Those days are gone. We need to be able to get minorities out to vote. We need to be able to get our, our women out to vote. And we need to be able to give them that reason to vote. And we need to be able to make sure that it starts in high school, that they have that reason to be able to get out there, not just when it's a, a big national race or it's a contentious race, but all the time to study their candidates. So they need that reason why. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hernandez. Uh, Mr. Herrera, we, I will repeat the question. The League of Women Voters supports online voter registration and universal ballot by mail. What policies, if any, do you support to improve voter participation and to ensure secure elections in Texas? Uh, one would be to allow same day voter uh, registration and uh, voting. In other words, on the day of voting, you can actually go and register if you haven't already registered to vote and actually cast your ballot. Uh, the, another bill that we filed, that I filed, uh, was to make sure that when you go renew your driver's license, it's an automatic registration for your uh, voter registration. So making sure that we allow individuals to be able to vote. The idea of super uh, precincts uh, also should be expanded. It shouldn't just be on limited days. It should be throughout the early voting. We should also expand on the availability of temporary early voting locations. Um, you know, instead of having budget constraints, limit the people, especially in rural areas like in Robstown, Petronila, Agua Dulce, Driscoll from being not having a place to vote in their own community. It's absurd. We should make sure that people have the, every right to be able to vote. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now move on to uh, closing statements. Gentlemen, you'll have one minute each and we'll start with Mr. Herrero this time. Thank you again, the League of Amendment voters and everyone who's uh, participating and listening. Uh, I wanna wish my opponent good luck. Uh, I understand that he's a hard worker. I appreciate that, I respect that. Uh, I ask that you vote for my position for state representative for myself, Abel Loretto for state representative not just because of my past experience, my upbringing, my knowledge, but also my seniority. Having been in the legislature, I understand what it means to work across the aisle. Uh, I've worked with Gene Seaman, for example, uh, to work with vocational training programs uh, to ensure that we bring those programs to uh, junior high. Uh, worked with Todd Hunter, for example, on the calendars committee to make sure that we get the bills that are important to our communities like Rachel's Law and uh, Mary's Law, for example, to help uh, curtail and end domestic violence. So all of this to ensure that we all work together to ensure that we put Texas first, uh, the communities first, so that we have faith in our future. Just like as a child that I had faith growing up in La Armada and the GI projects and rental homes, I knew that there was hope. So I ask for your support and your vote. Abel Lovero. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. And your closing statement, one minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abel. By the way, Gene says hi. And, uh, you know, to everybody out there. So I grew up in the poor, broke, and homeless. Uh, there was times that I'm sleeping on couch benches, couches, benches, I'm sleeping on the floor. And that's my reason why, is to be able to help others get out of poverty, to be able to address the situations that have been long forgotten about. I'm not running to be the representative. I'm running to be your full-time representative for everybody no matter what your party position, I'm here for you. I have an open door policy, and I wanna be able to say that, uh, Abel, I'm not running against you. I'm not running against the Democrat party. I'm running because I wanna improve the area, and I hope that this is a pass the baton situation and not a contentious race. So I wish you well uh, as well, and uh, you know, good luck to you as well. And to the community out there, I ask for your vote this November as a way to be able to improve District 34 and to, to have that representative that you want that's gonna be out in the community and be side by side with you, arm in arm. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you uh, candidates again for Texas State Representative District 34 for participating in this forum this evening. Thank you. All right.